Today we have Associate Professor Scott Summers, who is the Program Director of the PhD Program in Integrated Biology and Medicine from Duke NUS. Professor Scott Summers is also one of the principal investigators in the Cardiovascular and Metabolic Diseases Program, one of the five signature research programs at Duke NUS. Alright, hi Scott, thank you very much for joining us today. As the Program Director of the school's first PhD program, tell us more about the IBM at Duke NUS and how it is different from other PhD programs that are offered by other schools. Thanks, Dean. It's a pleasure to talk to you today about our new graduate program. We launched this program in August of 2010 and welcomed our first, first class then. The program offers a degree in integrated biology and medicine, which provides core training in something we call translational bioscience. And this, this core module really teaches individuals how to, uh, a lot of basic science principles, but also teaches them how to translate findings into the clinical setting. After the students receive this core training, they specialize in one of our core signature research programs, including cardiovascular metabolic diseases, cancer and stem cell biology, neuroscience and behavioral disorders, emerging infectious diseases, and health systems and services research. This is part of the overall mission uh, that Duke has to prepare real clinician scholars, people who are able to really enable translational research. As you know, a big part of this has been to have research be an active component in our MD program. Well, what we're doing here is, is very similar, except we're training PhDs that have a more clinical mindset and have more of a knowledge base related to disease pathology and translational concepts. And we think by putting those PhD trained individuals with MDs that have a research focus, we're going to inspire a new type of research team that really catapults uh, translational research forward. Tell us more about the core course in more detail. So the core program, uh, the core training module that we have, we call, it's a course we call Molecules to Medicine. And, and it really covers a, a broad spectrum of, of things. So the students really are, it's, it's a challenging semester to be sure, but students are really introduced to a lot of concepts related to biomedical and health services research. So, so the types of things we, we talk about, the first two thirds of the course, there's a lot of basic science and disease pathology. We talk about uh, a lot of new techniques, uh, how to use model organisms to study disease, genomics, proteomics, enzyme kinetics, uh, you know, a, a lot of basic science things. But one of the things we do in this core course is we cover a lot of topics that traditionally are not part of graduate training, but are relevant to anybody who's wanting to study disease. We do things, uh, we, we provide training in things like population studies, how to do clinical trials, how to develop biomarkers, do drug screens, how to do clinical epidemiology. We even talk about intellectual property. Uh, we, we discuss scientific ethics throughout the course. We think that's a really important uh, thing to introduce to our students very, very early. And the whole time that we're doing this, we're really staying in the primary literature. So students are getting to see real world examples of, of these types of things in action. And we think this really helps transition to the to a graduate type of education. You indicate that students can receive specialty training in various disease areas defined by the university's signature research programs. So how is this type of training provided? Yeah, so after our students complete the, um, the core training, it, it, that's the first semester, and, and simultaneously what they're doing is they do two laboratory rotations where they work in the lab of a prospective thesis mentor. So after they've completed these two rotations, they choose a thesis lab and they identify their specialty area that they want to focus on, uh, one of the five that I mentioned earlier. And then the, the, the faculty mentor and the student do two things. First of all, they identify a thesis project that the student will then work on for the next um, four-ish years. And also, they develop a specialty curriculum for the student to really become an expert in their, their particular disease area or health outcome. And so, most of our uh, specialty programs have dedicated courses. For example, our cancer program has a couple of dedicated cancer courses that all the students take. And so they really become knowledgeable in their disease pathology. What are the novel features of this program which distinguishes itself from more traditional ones? I think there are four things that are really unique about our IBM degree. First of all is the makeup of the class. The constituents that we have in the, in the 
class come from a variety of different backgrounds. So they have undergraduate training in, in, in some basic science disciplines, maybe in health economics. And we also have a significant portion of the class that has clinical awareness. So half of the class, for example, are either MD students that have had a year in the clinics already as part of our, our Duke and U.S. MD program, or they come with MBBS degrees and have experience actually, actually working with patients. So we think by mixing those constituents with people with ba basic science training, we end up enabling translational research that keeps a, a focus on the patient. The second thing that's different is rather than specializing in a, a particular basic science discipline like biochemistry or something like that, our students specialize in a disease area or health outcome. And so we really are trying to train experts in a particular disease pathology and we think this has real translational impacts as well. The third thing is the way we, the core training we provide, we actually introduce our students to a unique set of topics that are a little different than most translational um, programs. So, um, for example, we'll teach students about um, biomarkers or drug screens or how to do clinical trials or things like that. And by introducing them to these translational concepts, in addition to the basic science about enzyme kinetics and, and proteomics, genomics, things like that, we think we really train somebody that thinks with a very different type of translational mindset. And the last thing is we, we use the team-based learning approach that has been so popular in the MD program. And this type of training really changes the way that, uh, that students learn and also changes the type of graduate student they become. And we think it really transitions them to a graduate school mindset. You mentioned the introduction of team learning. Duke NUS has received a lot of attention for introducing team learning into the medical school curriculum. Can you briefly explain team learning and discuss why you think it is appropriate for a PhD program? Yeah, we're really excited about using team learning in the PhD program and, and, and really think it's perfect for training the type of people that we're trying to, to produce. Uh, as you know, team learning is, is an active form of learning where students come to class prepared, they participate in discussions, they work in groups in ways that, that helps promote knowledge retention and helps enable critical thinking. And that's exactly the kind of things we want to do in a, in a PhD program. We're trying to get away from the memorization mindset and one where one really thinks critically about how to, how to propel science forward. Um, our program is, is, is very similar to the MD program, although it's such a small class that there are some differences that emerge. So our students, like in the MD program, they come to class. The first thing that they do is they take an exam showing that they've mastered a, a set of uh, content. They then get together as a group and they work through a group exercise where they retake this exam. This allows them to gain confidence in their knowledge because they get to see where they, how they, their knowledge ranks with their peers. And it promotes really good discussions which promote knowledge retention. Then our students get together with a content expert, a faculty member who put together these exams and they have a discussion which can, can be quite informal but is very active and, and the students are, are often, you'll sit in, a, in the class for 30 minutes and you'll see every student ask a question. And the students are challenging instructors, it's, it's really a, a neat, neat educational experience to see. One of the things that happens as a result of this though is is we don't have a top-down learning process. Instead, what we have is we've leveled the playing field because the student starts to become more like a peer, a scientific peer with a faculty expert, and they have more of a discussion rather than a more didactic seminar where the students are passively sitting in, in the classroom or, or maybe more accurately sleeping in the classroom. So we think this, this type of uh, Team learning really works for us. Now, we also do the application exercises, which the MD program uses. Those tend to be very clinical in nature in the MD program. Ours tends to focus on the primary literature, to use journal clubs, to use research tools in very practical ways. So we really talk about how to do research and, and, and how to critically dissect research. So uh, the, overall, I think the team learning really trains the type of critical thinking process that we, we want to enable in, in our students. What are the entrance requirements of the program? Well, there's no doubt that our program is a competitive one. Um, we, our, our students typically have really good grades and good GRE scores. There are other factors, though, that we, we consider quite heavily. All of our students do interviews. We look at the type of research training that they have, uh, somebody that's, that's published a lot of papers or, or has a lot of uh, research experience is somebody who, who we look at quite favorably. 
Um, and uh, these types of experiences, excellence in one can sort of mitigate others. We don't have absolute cutoffs for GRE scores or grades or something like that. We try and look at the whole package to find somebody that's really a good fit for what we're trying to do. But this team-based approach, you know, the, the, the makeup of the class matters and the types of experiences they have matter. So we really try and match people so we have a cohesive team. Is there any financial aid if a student joins the PhD program? All of our students receive full financial support for their graduate training. This includes uh, full coverage of tuition and fees. It includes um, uh, a living stipend, and um, there are even some, some other allowances for travel and books and things like that in some of our scholarship programs. Uh, the, the types of awards the students get differ both, both in amount and some of them have service obligations depending on the agency that provides them. Some of our scholarships have no service obligations. So, they, but we'll, so we really try and match the type of scholarship with, again, with the student. So Scott, can you tell us more about the thesis requirements? So when the students conduct their thesis research, this, this work tends to, to take a, a while. Uh, the expectation is that they produce a scholarly piece of work that really makes a difference in the literature. So they do this mentored research where they have a, a research advisor, but there's no doubt this is a research degree first and foremost, and the students spend a lot of time in, in the laboratory or, or in health services research um, out in the field um, trying to make a scholarly contribution.